You're in the trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics. And you're smart to be in the trenches because Boomer Sison joins us in the trenches. And this guy is a Bengals legend, and rightfully so. Well-earned, well-deserved. League MVP, unquestioned leader. This guy, honestly, is the greatest leader of men I think I've ever seen. Boomer Sison. So many things to talk about. So many things to listen to. Great stories from Boomer Sison. You're about to see why he is who he is. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about In the Trenches with Dave Lapham this time because it's brought to you by First Star Logistics. And our special guest is none other than the legendary Boomer Sison who, in my opinion, is the greatest leader of men that I've ever met. What's going on, Boomer? <laughs> hey, Dave. Thanks for the uh, compliment, as always. You know, I am so uh, happy to be here because it means that the NFL season is getting started. And the Bengals, you know, have to be one of the favorites to make it back to the Super Bowl. And I think both you and I can attest to just how difficult that is. No doubt. Uh, I remember uh, <laughs> we went to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl sixteen. Uh, we don't win the football game. We come back the following year. It's a it's a, a strike year. It's a work stoppage year, as they said. We only played nine games, go seven and two, but we get a very high seed. We have a bye. Then we have to play the Jets. And Freeman McNeil rushes for returning yards, and we get edged 44-17, and we're out. So we don't even win a playoff game. And yeah. speak to speak to the season following your Super Bowl 23 season. You guys had a great team. We're in every football game. It just didn't work out. I mean, not a, not enough uh, wins in close games, I guess. That's exactly right. Actually, we won 500 in 1989 after the 88 season. And really what ends up happening is that, you know, you have a harder schedule. Yep. You are now the mark team. You're no longer sneaking up on anybody. Mm -hmm. And like the Bengals found out last year, and like I found out in 88, and I'm sure you guys found out in 82, you know, you got to have a lot of breaks along the way. You know, and breaks happen in different ways. And when you think about Lou Anarumo's defense last year, think about, you know, all right, we're going to bend, we're going to bend, we're going to bend, but we're going to come up with plays when we need to make plays. And nothing typified that more than the game against Kansas City, when at the end of the first half, Kansas City decides to go for a touchdown and the defense keeps them out of the end zone and they don't attempt a field goal. And then the next thing you know, the second half starts and the Bengals have all the momentum going into the locker room and coming out of the locker room. So our defense got a lot of uh, turnovers for us back in 88. Uh, they always seemed to be Johnny on the spot. They made it a lot easier for us on offense. We used to score a lot of points, which I think also let the defense play a different style of defense with Dick LeBeau. So you got to have the breaks. There's no question about that. you got to have the coaching, and you certainly need the help. And the one thing I will say, Dave, about this year's Bengals team, that I really do appreciate is that they went out and they spent money and they built the offensive line around who I think is one of the top three quarterbacks in the NFL today. And that is Joe Burrow. Couldn't agree with you more. And in your talk comment about uh, turnovers, I mean, during the regular season, this Bengal team last year was even zero mm -hmm. tied for 16th in the NFL, right in the middle of the pack. Well, in the postseason, the run they had in the postseason, they're plus seven. They get eight interceptions. Seven different guys get eight interceptions. And they recover yeah. a fumble. Nine takeaways, two giveaways. They're plus seven. That's going to win you games, No, whether it's playoff or preseason, whatever the hell it is. going to win you how games. Else, how else do you win a game in which you get sacked nine times on the road in the playoffs? You have to do that by getting turnovers. So, uh, you know, I know Joe got hit a lot last postseason. Hopefully he won't get hit nearly as much this postseason. He learns to get rid of the ball a little bit quicker than he did. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's a growing process for all of us who play the position. Uh, I think he learned a lot about his team last year, and hopefully he feels a little bit more secure this year, at least starting. And, you know, when you think about starting against a team that has a good pass rush, uh, you know, that's the Pittsburgh Steelers. No doubt. Yeah, when you look at it, in that Tennessee game you're talking about, they get sacked nine times, but three interceptions from mm -hmm. nine sacks. Tannehill get picked off the first pass of the game, first pass of the second half and the last pass of the game. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to do it. You know, I mean, it's a uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> it, was, it was over, man. Oh man. But you're, you're right, Boomer. You're, you're addressed. And I know your offensive linemen loved you 
because, you know, you understood the importance of what those guys were about up front. And you took care of your old line better than anybody I'd ever heard of taking care of their, their offensive line. And they, they did everything and anything they could to make things mm -hmm. work for you. Um, this group has got, it's, it's been overhauled 80%, four out of five are new guys. That's yeah. unheard of. A team that went to the Super Bowl, four new starters in the offensive line, a rookie at left guard, three veterans at center, right guard and right tackle. What do you think, Boomer? Is it is it they're obviously going to be playing better at the end of September than they do at the beginning because they really haven't they haven't even played a snap yet in the preseason. Yeah. But do you think that that veteran experience that will mesh pretty quickly? I hope it does, man. I, you know, I think it really comes down to Joe Burrow and how he handles things. And you know, you put Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, you know, you put these top end quarterbacks in an offense, they can make anything work. And that's one of the reasons why they won as far as they did last year, you know, even with the patchwork offensive line and the struggles that they were having, you know, Joe never, you know, he never bowed down, you know, he didn't flinch. And, you know, that's the most important aspect of the quarterback is to bring the best out, you know, in the players that you're playing with. And I think he does that just about as well as anybody in the NFL. The other thing I will say, Dave, you're right. I was very kind to my offensive linemen, and I can only think how much money I would have spent on them had I been playing in today's game making $40 million a year. I think I would have written them each a million-dollar check and said, have at it, boys. Let's go. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. They're yeah. probably thinking, oh, we were born too early, man. We were all born a little too early. That's all what right. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I hear that, Coach. No doubt about it. Uh so you mentioned you you have Joe Burrow as one of your top three quarterbacks in the National Football League. Is there something about him or multiple things about him? And by the way, you mentioned his toughness. That's a common denominator between, in my mind, Joe Burrow and Boomer Esiason. You guys are probably two of the more most physically tough and mentally tough quarterbacks I've ever been around. And, you know, it's like I think that's why the offensive lines and everybody respects – you guys, because I mean, the game's about toughness, mental and physical, and you guys are great examples of it. Is that the biggest thing you like about Joe, or are there other things? Oh, there's, there's, there's so much to like about him. You know, I remember talking to Jeff Hobson uh, before the draft, before they drafted Joe Burrow, and I said, "Look, man, the kid was a All-State point guard at, at Athens High School, I believe it was." Yep. And I said, "So, you know, he understands you know, the distribution of the of the basketball, and he yep. understands the distribution of the football." And really, point guard and 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 uh, quarterback are pretty much the same, with the exception that you have to deal with six more people or seven more people, I guess, uh, than you would on a basketball court. But I, I just think that there's so much to love about him, and the leadership aspect of it is a huge part of it. You know, a lot of these kids, when they step on the field, you don't know who they are until they actually step on the NFL field. And you actually see how they go about their business and whether or not they flinch, whether or not they're afraid, whether or not their nervousness and the intensity of the game gets to them, you know, and a lot of players over the last four or five years that have been high draft picks at the quarterback position have not made it because they don't have that it factor. And when I say Joe's one of the top three quarterbacks in the league, I'm talking about the young quarterbacks. I'm not talking about Tom Brady and, and Aaron right. Rodgers. Right. I'm talking about Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, uh, you know, Justin Herbert and, of course, Joe Burrow, you know, that that collection of four players right there are, are going to be the future of the of, of the NFL. And that's why I think the NFL playoffs were so damn exciting last year, because they all they all participated in it. You know, I mean, it was just unbelievable what they all were able to do. So um, I just think that the thing you worry about now, if you're the Bengals, is they're not going to be complacent. There's going to be pressure because pressure, you know, is there because now there are expectations and the expectations are real. Now, Joe Burrow has dealt with those expectations, both at the college level and at the NFL level. He's already shown that he can handle all of that pressure. The question is, can the rest of the team handle the pressure? Can Zach Taylor and his coaching staff handle the pressure? You know, I think uh, by virtue of what we saw last year, I think the answer to that is probably yes. But like I said, now all of a sudden they become the hunted. And everybody is going to throw their best efforts at them to beat them, including the Pittsburgh Steelers in week one. You know, I look at I look at um, the tight end position and both Super Bowl teams, Super Bowl 16, Super Bowl 23, had great tight ends. We had Dan Ross, who was phenomenal, led the team in catches, 71 catches, just like Gumby. He was like a rubber man. The guy was just able to 
make plays to how the hell did he do that? And they they double him, linebacker safety, all that stuff, bracket and try to do everything they could. And you had Rodney Holman. This team has Hayden Hurst. And Baltimore doubled when when the Bengals had three receivers out there on the football field, the big three. You know, you're talking about Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd. They doubled every one of them. And I'd never seen that before. They've doubled, doubled all those guys. So now the tight end can eat, right? I mean, it's like, I think Hayden Hurst might have a big year. And looking at prior Super Bowls, they had a tight end that had a big year, right? Yeah, I, I just I just hope that Hayden can stay healthy. That's really the big thing with him. You know, I will say this, being here in New York, uh, the Jets love C.J. Usama. They yeah. love him, and he's yeah. been great. He's been exactly what the Jets needed at that position. So uh, the Jets have fixed their tight end problem with the addition and, you know, there's always going to be additions and subtractions all year long, and you got to kind of balance what you think is the most important thing for you. And let's face it, you just mentioned those three wide receivers in with Joe Mixon. I mean, those collective four may be the best collection of four playmakers on the field at one time. And you're with a very highly accurate, uh, accurate quarterback. You're going to have an explosive offense. As a matter of fact, I think they're predicted to be either the second or third highest scoring offense in the NFL this year. I think they just, you know, just barely touched the tip of the iceberg last year because, you know, you had a rookie in Jamar Chase who was just still trying to figure it out. Imagine how much better he's probably already been this year through training camp. I remember the second year of Eddie Brown. It was like, like he was great his first year, uh, Dave. And then all of a sudden his second year is like, boom, he took off. Yeah. And really understood about route running. And then we added Tim McGee and we had speed on, on, on both sides. We had quickness yeah. on both sides. And I kind of feel like, and I, and I hate always going back to comparing, but it gives Bengal fans a real good flavor of the way I look at this. Um, I see a lot of that same stuff with Joe and his wide receivers now. He's got, he's got a bunch of guys that he's been with. He knows Jamar from college. They obviously got, the rookie, got him the rookie of the year last year. Yep. So I, I think this, this team is the sky is the limit in terms of scoring. They, they, should, they should be one of the top three scoring uh, outfits in the entire NFL. You know, the thing that's good about them, all, all three of these guys, too, is uh, they can all line up multiple spots. You know, it's not like, ah, you just have an X right here. You just have a Z right here. You know, you have a Y. You can, they can move around. They can motion. It's not like you. that's the only spot he can play, and you can double them and try to take them out of it. So they have that, you know, the, the intelligence to be able to handle a lot of things and in the, in, in, in the physical ability to be able to, to handle a lot of things. I, I'm really – and like you said about Jamar, Man, he didn't take anything for granted, Boomer. You would love you, you'd love this guy. I mean, his offseason hired a, a track coach, worked on his speed, worked on all this stuff, came back five pounds lighter, not intentionally, but just worked so hard. So here's a guy that's like, I'm not resting on any laurels, man. I can be better. You gotta love that, don't you? I do love that. And I love the fact that, you know, the the numbers in terms of the amount of money that these guys are starting to make is starting to have an imprint on a lot of these guys. And I think that there's motivation there to get to the big box and to be yep. considered one of the best players at your position. You know, just think for a second, you're just talking about how you can interchange a lot of these different players, you know, and that's really up to Zach Taylor and, and his offensive staff to really come up with all these different ideas. And I think that's kind of the trend in the NFL right now, as we saw with the San Francisco 49ers and Debo Samuel last year. Yeah. We're going to see some of that with Tyree Kill and Mike McDaniel down in uh, Miami. I think it's going to be unbelievable watching how he coaches uh, Tyreek down there with Tua. But uh, mm -hmm. just again, you know, you think about what Jamar was able to do as a rookie. And he really didn't know what he didn't know at that point. Yeah. And as the season went on, you know, he got better and better and better and better. And to the point where even the last play of the Super Bowl, he had, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, you know, beaten for a touchdown if Joe Burrow has half a second longer to throw the ball and the game would have been over and the Bengals would have won. Yep. So I, I just think that now with another year under his belt, just think of all the different other things you're going to be able to do with him. Because I'm sure last year at the beginning, it was like, let's keep it simple. Let's let him be effective. Let's not let him think too much. Because I think we as athletes, when we get on the field and our brain gets in our way, this is when we make mistakes. And I know as a rookie, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so when I was out there and I was trying to play and think at the same time, it didn't look very pretty until, until my second year when it all snapped for me. Yeah. And I think Jamar is going to be that much more effective just because of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Ramsey falls down. Jamar's, I mean, oh, a half a second more, and the Bengals are Super Bowl champions, Boomer. That's true. Crazy. All right. So let's put let's put Super Bowl 56 season 
aside because, you know, um, got to wipe the slate clean, got to start over again. But they understand the work, the sacrifice. There are a lot of guys that were part of that. They can carry that part over. But it, like you said, it doesn't mean it's going to happen again. A lot of things have to fall right for you. And you open up with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Let's talk about this season and this season opener. All it is is a division rival and division wins, a tiebreaker at the end of the year. They're super important. It's a home division game. Pittsburgh Steelers. Are you kidding me? Double chin strap, big shoulder pads. Let's go, baby. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. But no more Ben Roethlisberger, thank God. Now it's time for the Bengals with their quarterback situation to really start uh, dominating this particular division. Now, I know yep. that the quarterbacks have dealt you know, with Lamar Jackson in Baltimore and, of course, Kenny Pickett eventually in Pittsburgh and then Deshaun Watson eventually in Cleveland. You know, it's going to be hard to dominate this division at that position. But if there were a moment in time where you know you have the better player at the most important position, this is it. And, you know, Mitch Trubisky has been a fine NFL quarterback, not great by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he's a guy that kind of fits the moniker of the Steelers. I think it's one of the reasons why they went out and signed him this offseason before they drafted Kenny Pickett. And that's why he's probably starting. But he had a pretty good preseason. He moves around pretty well. Uh, the Steelers' offensive line isn't as good as it has been in the past. Their running game is shouldn't be nearly as good. But they do have wide receivers, and they do have a really good tight end. So they have playmakers as well on the outside. The big knock against Trubisky, if I had one, would be his accuracy and his tendency to break the pocket quicker than he has to. Like, Ben would stand in there, and the game wouldn't start or the play wouldn't start until he got hit a few times. So I, I just think that you've got – if they're going to win – it's, it goes back to the turnover game again. Don't give it to them on defense, and you got to you got to take two or three away from Mitch Trubisky because that's what he's been known for. Here's my trivia tidbit on Trubisky: two hundred quarterbacks have played fifty games in the National Football League over the last seventy years, and Mitchell Trubisky is one of them. He's the only one that hasn't thrown a pick six in his career. How about huh. that? How about I'll that? take that. I'll oh, yeah. take that. You know. Yeah, you know, so you know, you know, you know what he is. You know what he is. He's a, he's a real he's a good football player. He really right. is. I'm not. Right. He's not a top fifteen quarterback in the league, and he never was. Uh, he got drafted way too high, and and Ryan Pace, the former GM of the, uh, the Chicago Bears, went out on a limb to draft him. Right. But if I if I had to play games with him, I could try to fashion an offense around him, play action, a lot of running, have him moving in and out of the pocket. I could win with that guy. Now, can I win 10 or 11 games in a 17-game season? I think not. But could I win, say, four out of six games in the middle of the season with him being my backup? I would say yes. I agree. I agree. So you talked about um, Pittsburgh's offense. Defensively, boom, this, this one blew my mind, you know, because I think of Pittsburgh, like you said, they run the ball and they stop the run. Last year, they only rushed it for 93 yards, 29th in the league. They gave up 146, dead last, five yards of carry, dead yeah. last, worst they've ever had since they were keeping stats in franchise history. But yet, 55 sacks led the NFL, and they've led the NFL five years in a row with 50 sacks or more every year. It doesn't add up to me. One plus one doesn't equal two because they couldn't stop the run, yet they still destroyed you know, people pressuring the quarterback. How do you attack this Pittsburgh Steelers defense uh, in, in your eyes? <laughs> Well, first and foremost, you have to protect. And I remember playing against that 34 defense. I mean, it's a pain in the ass. Pass protections are a pain in the ass. Uh, communication is a pain in the ass. You got to kind of keep things a little bit simple. Um, you know, they they were their physical defense. They always want to try to impose their will against you. That's their moniker. That's the way they like to play. So that's why you and I both know it's a double chin strap game and let's buckle it up and let's go because it's going to be physical. Um, you know, the, the one thing that you really got to be careful of because of those sacks, fumbles, turnovers, uh, a hurry that turns into a tip pass or something of that nature. You know, TJ Watt's a pain in the neck. Uh, and you got to make sure that you got two guys going his way because, you know, it's going it's going to be a dog fight from the, the get go, from the get go to the last whistle. T.J. Watt and his motor are just going to keep coming. And he's the one that is the energy on that defense. I would say that their linebackers haven't been quite as good as they have been in past years. Uh, and I know that they're trying and I know they've tried to fix that this offseason. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve 
there for the uh, for the Steelers on defense as well. But you know, nonetheless, it's a, like I said, it's a division game. It's it's unpredictable, and you just got to be ready to play because I know Mike Tomlin will have his guys ready. I agree. I mean, it's it's they have a new defensive coordinator, uh, Austin Terrell Austin is is the new defensive coordinator, and you know it's like all right, they Mike Tomlin though is the common denominator, and he's run that that three three you know almost looks like three three stack college defense where he's got a plugger and the plugger's a guy named T.J. Watt like you said, and he'll hit different gaps, and this guy has got over twenty sacks, and a lot of them he beats the hell out of people, but I'll see a few where. He's a free runner because didn't recognize, didn't communicate. Like you said, they didn't get it done in terms of seeing it and communicating it. How the hell does that guy not have a <laughs> finger on him as he's going to the quarterback? So, you know, you're going to have to be sharp in that regard. There's, there's no doubt about it. And I would think the offensive line, I know Boomer, they were like, always, we can't let Boomer get touched. Never mind sack. We can't let him get touched. This group has to be like, this guy just had an appendectomy here fairly really. We can't <laughs> get hit, right? We gotta That's true. Him, well, you know, I mean, look, you know, it's a lot of this is communication on the offensive line and with the running backs. You know, David, not to get too technical, you and I would know that if we were playing against the Steelers, a lot of times we would start with a seven-man protection, and this would kind of take some of the guesswork out of the pass protection part of it, um, and everybody would be, like, solid, and we'd cover the edges – and we wouldn't be uh, screwed up with the fire zones and all these different things that Dick LeBeau uh, brought to Cincinnati and then he brought to Pittsburgh. So yep. you'd be able to fight through some of those things just by simplifying some of the pass protections. Now, the game has changed, and they're going to want to have three wide receivers out on the field as much as they possibly can because that's that's their running gun style. And when you have three wide receivers out on the field, you usually have short sides. And that's where the vulnerabilities are in your offense, and that's where – Mike Tomlin and his defense for so many years have taken advantage of those short edges. So whoever is out there, whoever is responsible, whether you're sliding left or you're sliding right with the offensive line or the running back is involved in the pass protection or the H back or the tight end is involved in the pass protection, you know, they have to make sure that they're communicating with their tackles and they have to make sure they know who they're responsible for blocking. And the one thing I hate, is watching a tight end try to block T.J. Watt. They don't have a shot in hell of blocking him when it comes to I, pass protection. And I don't ever want to see that. I, I hear you. And that, coming back to the offensive line, uh, this this group, again, 80% of it, four guys, four new starters. But the veteran guys, I mean, center, Karras, two Super Bowls with the, yeah. with the Patriots. One, two. He knows what it's supposed to look like. Kappa? Super Bowl, Tom Brady's the common denominator with the with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Collins, good player, playoff participant with the Dallas Cowboys, very big physical stout guy. The thing is, though, they haven't played next to each other in a live situation. They didn't even play preseason uh, snap. So I'm thinking, all right, these veterans, let's get that communication because that's going to be – I'm glad it's at home and not on the road in loud Pittsburgh where you can have a chance to communicate and all that with all that they're, they might be trying to do. But that, that's going to be – haven't played next to this guy, don't really, you know, have an idea of, oh, are we on the same level if they twist and stun up front? I, I don't think it's going to be that big an issue, but I think that it, they're going to be better even in the second half of the football game than they are in the first half. Well, that, well, yeah, that, that goes to reason, but I would also say we won't really know who they are until about week five, six, or seven, and True. everything, everybody starts settling down. You know, you don't want to overreact the first three or four weeks of the season. If the Bengals happen to lose this game, yeah, it's going to be terrible. It's, it's a bad way to start, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, yeah. I don't expect that. I don't expect that to happen. I think the Bengals are going to be raring, you know, raring to go, and I think they're going to be up for this game. And they can't wait to get back on the field after losing uh, last year's Super Bowl. No, it's interesting. You talk about communication. So on my left side, I had Montoya and Munoz for all those years. Yep. Those guys could talk in Spanish with each other, you know, and they could screw up everybody. And then I either had Remington or Kazerski at center, and then yep. I had Reimers and Walters or Blados at, on the right side. And those guys, you know, they knew each other so well. We all hung out together yep. that, you know, they, they, they could just look at each other and understand what each other's responsibilities were. And the only one who ever really got mad was Max. 
you know, he would just yell at me. And I think he was the one that was like singled out to yell at the quarterback because, you know, Anthony would never yell at me. And the other guys were just, you know, nice guys, didn't say much. So Max was always the guy that had to yell at me if I screwed up the pass protection. So I don't know. It's just, but it is important. I, you know, the game has changed so much, Dave, since you and I played. We both know that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just, I just feel like the athletes on the outside, like every team used to have one maybe. It seems like every team has two or three now, whether they have their hand in the dirt or whether they're standing up like a TJ Watt. You know, they can, they can come at you in, in waves. And that's why it is so important that this offensive line kind of get in sync with one another as quickly as possible. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that this offensive line that they've revamped, you know, for this particular season, they're edgy. A lot of these guys have an edge to them, like you were talking about. Rhymer's man, he may not say much, but he'll hit you right in the mouth. You know, Max will hit you in the mouth while he's talking to you. And they, they all, they had an edge, you know. Yep. And uh, and, and th this group, I think, does too. That uh, This one's going to be, I, I can't wait, can't wait to, to watch it, can't wait to see it. But like you said, Boomer, how about the three wide receivers the Bengals have you know, you, you're talking Jamar Chase, you're talking T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd, that trio. And then the trio at safety with Dax Hill in the mix, with Jesse Bates. Now he's back and Von Bell just elected a captain. That three, those threesomes, that that trio of safeties, trio of wide receivers, I'm not sure anybody in the NFL can say they got a better trio on either side of the ball. So you you would know better than I do. I would ask you this question. Is Jesse Bates happy? Uh, I probably can't say that he's happy. I think he's content in what in what his situation is. I'm sure he would have liked to have had a had a contract done, but I think he realizes 12.9 is good each, you know, and it's all guaranteed, you know. He's, <laughs> no, he's, no, it's 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 a it's a big number for safety, you know, and right. you know the Bengals shelled out a lot of money. They let C.J. Uzama go. I yep. mean, you know, you have to start balancing the balance sheets a little bit here, and you know, assuming that Joe Burrow does what I we all think he's going to do, um, you know, then that number becomes inflated in a couple of years. And that number is going to be huge. Plus, I mean, it is going to be, it, it, it could be 50, but I know, listen, you tried to do this to me way back when in 1997. <laughs> so I don't want to do it to him right now and start saying what the Bengals should pay somebody uh, to keep them. But uh, the market will, will, will tell uh, the, you know, the Brown, the Brown family has always paid the quarterback. I don't care what anybody says. They've always paid us for the most part. Yeah. Uh, they have always recognized the importance of the position. Um, they ripped up my contract two different times and and gave me raises when they didn't have to. So they'll end up paying Joe. It's just a matter of what kind of year Joe will have this year. Will he bring him back to the playoffs again? Will he have the numbers that he had last year? And will he continue to grow? And if he does, then the number is going to be like off the charts. And it will be north of 40. I will say that. I don't know if it will be 50 by that time, but all I know is that once the Apple subscription, well, I believe they're going to get the direct TV, uh, you know, um, a Sunday ticket. Yeah. And when that kicks in next year, yeah. uh, then, then all of a sudden the salary cap is probably going to go up another 10 to 20 to 30 million. Who knows? Yeah. And that's why it's, it's good that they spent money now. Because even though, you know, Joe's making a lot of money, he's not making the money that he's going to make in about three years. No doubt. No doubt. I mean, you got Wilson averaging forty nine million a year on the contract he signed. Yeah, but, yeah, but the back back end of that contract, true for Gazy, and and, and I, I think I think we spoke about Russell Wilson last year. I told you that he would not be with Seattle because he has been he would be, he was angling for a new contract with two years yeah. left to go on his on his present contract after right. last year. Right. And the Seattle Seahawks said, "You know what? We're not paying you. We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna trade you. We're gonna trade you to somebody who's desperate for a quarterback because." They haven't had a quarterback in seven years, the Denver Broncos. And the Denver Broncos, the last time they had a legitimate quarterback, his name was Peyton Manning. Right. And now this is what Russell Wilson is a celebrity quarterback. He's a big name. He's had a lot of success. He's a Super Bowl winner. And, uh, you know, Denver was willing to pay for it. And they not only paid for it in terms of the trade, but also in the new money that they gave him. But if you look at that contract, the last couple of years, Denver can get out of it with uh, without too much of a – uh, too much of a penalty. Right, right. All right, so let me ask you, let's get back to Pittsburgh for a second. You played against the Pittsburgh Steelers many times. What is your most memorable game against the Pittsburgh Steelers? Or, or what's your biggest memory in general against the Pittsburgh Steelers? You and Sam Weiss have to have some funny stuff to do. Like oh, yeah, we, 
we had a lot of funny stuff take place. Uh, I remember we were playing once in uh, River, uh, no, Three Rivers Stadium. Three Rivers, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I want to say, I don't know, it could have been, I don't know if it was 90 or 89. And uh, and I forget who the Pittsburgh Steeler was, but all I remember is Tim McGee getting hit across the middle. And Sam goes out to see Tim McGee, who's laying on his back, looks like he's been shot, right? And uh, Marv Pollins, our trainer, is there. And Marv and, and Sam are talking over Tim. And then Marv overhears, I mean, uh, Sam overhears Marv Pollins telling the trainer for the Steelers, I think he's going to be okay. I think he's just got the wind knocked out of him. And Sam went berserk, if I remember correctly. And he said, he's not going to be okay. Don't tell them he's going to be okay. So Marv's like, what, what? You know, like, you know, little Marv. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Sam said, uh, we need a stretcher. Get the stretcher out here. And Tim McGee's like, we need a stretcher. So they get the stretcher out there. And I think this is the game we're getting killed in too, by the way. And they get the stretcher out there. And uh, they tape Tim's head down on the stretcher. And then they take him into the locker room. And we come in at the end of the game. And Tim is strapped down to the stretcher in the locker room. And we see Marv and Sam arguing over the body of Tim McGee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we lost the game. And I, I go over to Tim. I said, uh, Tim, how you feeling? He goes, I'm fine. <laughs> Can you take the tape off? <laughs> Oh, I, mean, I, I don't want to it's, it's not something to make fun of but it was like so bizarre because yeah. i think sam was trying to get whoever the Steeler player was i don't know if it was rod woodson or somebody i think he wanted him suspended or something for the next game <laughs> because of the hit or something like that and uh just right. one of the funnier moments the other funny moment was my last year in cincinnati 97 uh i started the game before or no i came in the game before against indianapolis we had won so the next game was on the road at Pittsburgh, and Bruce Coslett said, "Look, you know Jeff Blake is okay. We're gonna we're gonna have him play in the game. We're gonna have him start." I said, "Okay, fine. I was here as the backup. No worries." Right. So in pregame warm up, you know how we the wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, they do the pat and go down the sidelines. Yep. And, and Coach Cower was standing on our side of the fifty yard line, uh, you know, and he had his you know his arms crossed and he had his chin out, he's, and he's looking at our team. Right. And I told the guys, you know, I had James Hunden, I had David Dunn, I had Darnay Scott, all young kids. Right. right. I'm like, guys, just run down there, but don't don't catch the ball. Let it try to hit near Coach Cower. <laughs> so I was trying to hit. I wasn't really trying. I wasn't trying to hit the coach before the game. But then he finally realized what the hell was going on. And he looks at me and goes, what are you doing? I'm going, get on the other side of the 50. And I'm screaming at him. So, uh, yeah, so that th those are some of the good memories. I, I actually do have a winning record against the Steelers. So I, I tell Coach Cower that every Sunday on the NFL today. And, yeah. you know, he, are, he already hit me with it. Steeler week. And I'm going, oh, it's Mitch Trubisky week. That's what Ooh. I'm calling it. Yeah. So. So. A lot of good memories. A lot of, lot of uh, a lot of physical games. Uh, I got, I think I threw for 409 yards in a game against them. And I remember Mike Merriweather coming around on a stunt. Mike and Merriweather. the last thing I remember was the, 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 the yellow, like the, or the black helmet coming right into my chin and knocking good. me out. Man. So, Mike yeah, Merriweather. but he was the hell of a player, that guy. He was. He was. He could move. I, the thing I remember, my most uh, pleasant memory, I guess, Pittsburgh is, when we did go to the Super Bowl in 81, AFC Championship, we beat Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh 17-10 to clinch, clinch the division on the road in Pittsburgh. And, man, when we came back, uh, the stadium was packed. It was like a movie scene, you know, packed with Bengal fans. The roads were packed. I mean, it was it was crazy. The city was going nuts because, that you know, that was the first uh, uh, Super Bowl season, and then they, they had bought in big time. So that, that, that was a great memory. But, you know, man, I like, always – I always say this, that the Bengals and the Steelers are run almost identically. Exactly. You don't, you don't realize it. You know, Marvin Lewis was a Bengal coach, what, for 16 years? Yeah. I think the same amount of time that Coach Cower had coached in Pittsburgh. And I know that, you know, sometimes the Bengals get a bad rap for whatever reason. And, you know, sometimes they, they bring it on themselves. Um, but they've always, you know, it's always been a competitive franchise. I mean, there have been some down years and there have been some bad moments in Bengal history for sure. 
But, you know, it's, it's the franchises are run, run the same. And if you look at the salary caps and you look at the way mm-hmm. like Coach Cower describes how they would run things in Pittsburgh, the same thing, you know, under Paul Brown and Mike Brown in Cincinnati is, is, is you know, so it's the same kind of deal. It's family owned and operated. Mm-hmm. They do things quietly. They don't, you know, they're not very vocal about things in public. Um, they always keep things within in the house. And it's something to behold to think that two teams can still be run that same way under the current set of media circumstances that we all find ourselves in. You're, no question about it, Boomer. The Brown family, the Rooney family, and, uh, you know, the practice facilities. Kenny Anderson has talked about that. You know, he coached with the Steelers, won a Super Bowl on their, on their coaching staff. He said it's unbelievable how the practice facilities, and, of course, he was there, you know, Three Rivers, and then he actually was there with the, with the newer uh, – operation the newer practice fields and everything but had seen both and it's it's very very similar i mean to to the even how they feed players on the plane or don't or whatever yes. the case may be I, it's it's all down to a t it's crazy family you think you think that you think that the uh the pittsburgh steelers have a business manager by the name of bill connelly that counts the string beans <laughs> that you can have a, a pre-game meal or no See, this is the kind of thing that you and I understand and we have a little fun with. And uh, yeah. but that's just that's just part of you know taking a shot here, taking a shot there when you can. So boomer, overall, your your feeling about the uh, about the Cincinnati Bengals. We talked about how hard it is to repeat. Um, the AFC North, you mentioned, you know, when, when all hands are on deck at the quarterback position, a different dynamic, but that n- might not be the case in, with a couple of franchises for a while. So what uh, you know, Cleveland's trying to figure things out, obviously, in the absence of Watson. What do you think? Where, where do you think the are the Bengals as good as anybody in the AFC North? Are they as good as anybody in the AFC? What's your what's your thought process? I do. I, I think that the continuity of the coaching staff is key. I think the continuity of the key players is key, and almost every single key player is back. Uh, the coaching staff uh, is stayed intact, as far as I know. Um, I think all of that stuff uh, bodes well for the Bengals this year. Uh, I I do know that Baltimore was just hit by just an onslaught of injuries last year. So the second half of their season really wasn't truly reflective of who they are. And, you know, they're, they're going to be a good team. And, and Lamar Jackson's a pain in the neck to deal with from a defensive perspective. I think on paper, Cleveland has a really good team, a really good offensive line, a great running game. Uh, Their defense is tremendous. They get after the quarterback. Miles Garrett is one of the top five defensive players in the NFL, I believe. T.J. Watts, one of the top five players in the NFL on defense, I believe. Uh, So you do have a very competitive division. Um, I have them winning the division preseason, if that means anything to you. But, uh, you know, 17 games is – and the breaks that you need to have, uh, you know, like teams like – the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, so they have been running roughshod over the AFC West for all these years. And now all of a sudden, now all four teams out there right. are legit. I mean, yes. you got a legit head coach in the Raiders. You got a legit head coach quarterback combination with the Chargers. Same thing with the Broncos. I mean, now all of a sudden, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them, you know, to roll off 12 wins. As good as okay. Patrick Mahomes is, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of teams stuck right around. 11 to 12 wins and they're going to be fighting for a second or third seed there'll be one team that runs away with it i'm not really sure who that team is just yet it it may be the buffalo bills i think that their division they're they're significantly better than every team in their division even though they have a very difficult schedule um, i still think that they have a chance to run away with the afc with the number one seed you know, it's interesting. Uh, last year's team that went to Super Bowl 56, they were the first team in franchise history to win a road playoff game. Your Super Bowl team, the one I played on, we both had number one seeds. We were home field advantage, won our games at home. Win on the road, win two of them on the road in, in very, very dramatic fashion. You know, I mean, and, and they could be the first Super Bowl team to win a playoff game, you know, after being in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, it's, I, I like them. I mean, I, I think I think they're in position. I think they elected seven captains, Boomer, and just like when you played, you were an unquestioned leader of the football team, but you had zero jerk factor on that team. You had so many guys, so many leaders, and so many position groups. That's what this football team has, and I think that's real important because there's going to be adversity. We know that. Every team faces adversity, and the more guys you have that know how to 
rally around each other and get over it, the better off you are, man. Yeah, there's no question about that, Dave. And I, I just think that, you know, number nine's got to stay upright. Uh, yep. they got to keep him healthy all year long. Uh, as long as he's healthy, they'll be in every game because he'll keep them in every game. Um, I think the defense has got to continue to grow. Um, I thought uh, Coach Anarumo did a, a great job last year of just mixing and matching from first half to second half. I mean, little adjustments that basically drove opposing quarterbacks crazy, which was really amazing when you think yeah. about it. Uh, he did it to Tannehill. He did it to Mahomes. Um, he all, you know, kind of did it to Stafford too, I would think, because I felt like, you know, the Bengals were in the game and had every chance to win the game, just like I think you probably felt with your team. And, and I certainly felt with my team, but um, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a long season, man. 17 games is a long way to go. Uh, and, you know, I think what you want to do is you want to be like the Bengals were last year. You want to be rising to the occasion late in the season. You know, it'd be great to get off to a 7-0 and start. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to tell me your last seven games, you're going to be 6-1 and one and you're going to be flying into the playoffs uh, and your team's going to be relatively healthy, I'll take that over any, you know, significant start uh, because that truly will tell you that the team is ready to ascend to – hopefully Super Bowl greatness, and hopefully this team will be one of those. You know, it's interesting. That's another point you make, Boomer, playing uh, putting, playing your best football at the most opportune time. Last year, in the middle of December, they're 7-6, and six, coming off back-to-back -back, uh, home losses, one of them bad, losing by 20 to the Chargers, and then losing a heartbreaker the following week to the 49ers in overtime. But two back-to-back -back losses, West Coast teams traveling three time zones, all that junk, and they lose both of them to fall to seven and six and everybody's like yeah yeah and they're like eh, no, we're all right we got this and they hit their stride you know so it's so important to be playing really well down the stretch that's a big deal isn't it it really is and you know i have two examples here in new york in 07 when i started my radio show here in new york city uh the giants you know were awful in the middle of the season and eli manning was getting booed out of the stadium and then all of a sudden they turned it on. They won three road games as a wild card team and then went on to beat the Patriots in the first Super Bowl in 07. And then in 12, the same thing. I, I mean, they had to go on the road, I think. one. I think they had one home game against the Vikings and I think they had two road games that they had to win. And then they had to beat the Patriots again <laughs> in the Super Bowl. So uh, they ascended at the right time. Eli got hot at the right time. Uh, their defensive line was as about as uh, good as it gets in the NFL those two particular years with Michael Strahan and Justin Tuck and guys like that. And, you know, that that's kind of like what you got to have. I mean, man, hope springs eternal. Everybody right now is excited about their team. And just think if you're a Charger fan, a Bills fan, a Raiders fan, a Broncos fan, a Bengals fan, a Ravens fan, I mean, a Colts fan with, Matt, you know, with uh, Matt Ryan now. I mean, I'll, there are a lot of, like, exciting storylines that are heading into this season and the Bengals just happen to be one of them. Boomer, with that, I'll let you go because I know you're a busy man and for you to carve this much time to talk to us uh, is greatly appreciated. And I could talk football with you all day long, but I know I can't because you got other things to do, but you are the man. Appreciate the heck out of you. Hey, Rip Liz to you. You hear what I'm saying? I hear you. Rip All Liz, right. baby. Rip Liz. <laughs> All right. I'll see you, Dave. Take care, brother. Later, stud. All right, man. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team.